Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld. This is the September 8th DevOps Lunch and Learn, and uh, we had a great discussion. Uh, our HPC V2 is rescheduled for two weeks out, and we decided to start a book club with the Phoenix Project uh, by Gene Kim. So please check that out. Join us at the2030.com. Definitely a stream deck is useful for that because you can switch okay. scenes. Like if you can pre-save ah, your right. scenes, have them link to a physical button, and it okay. makes things a lot easier like when you're switching from recorded mode to um, like recorded mode to multi-speaker mode to okay. if you want to do the Brady Bunch uh, view, you know, things like that. It's, it's kind of nice to be able to do that. Okay. It's useful. Will, Are you using a Mac? No, I'm using Linux. Linux? Okay, cool. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't actually tried a Stream Deck under Linux yet. I, I'm pretty sure it'll work fine, but it's just buttons. We're, we are um, bringing, I'm promoting everybody in the background, by the way. Um, we are, let me pause to let it get caught up. Um, we're talking about doing a VMware live stream session, like during VMworld. Uh, Gene and I are planning it, and we'll, we'll come out with details and stuff like that. That should be fun. But tomorrow, uh, next week is a, I have a, there's an overlapping session from the people at, um, so not every cloud is equal winning with multi-cloud. And uh, it directly overlaps with this session. So I was going to suggest that if y'all are willing to, to be guinea pigs, uh, we would do this as a, um, Mystery Science uh, 3000 version of uh, of that talk, and we can we can I'll set up my streaming, and we can play a little bit. If that if y'all want to bring popcorn and then discuss the talk live, see how that goes. Cool. Right on. Good. I don't think I have somebody slotted in that slot yet. I have a couple of people on deck, but not not there. Oh, that's next week. Okay. Thanks. I, I keep expecting this week to be uh, quiet, but y'all are willing to talk DevOps on a holiday um, for the U.S. as a holiday week. So, welcome. I'm just here. So, one of the reasons why we're here is because. Uh, out here in California, we've been confined to the house for like the past two weeks between fires. smoke and outrageous heat. I yeah. mean, triple digit heat in San Jose, uh, San Francisco broke an all time record of 100 degrees in September. Uh, mm -hmm. broke a record from 1904 that was 92 degrees. So between smoke and heat, we haven't left the house. So yeah, this is our en my entertainment. <laughs> Glad to have you. But yeah, oh my goodness. I've been watching that. That's great. I know how hard that is from uh, houses around there are not structured for 100 degree temperatures. Well, ours isn't bad, but it's really it's a little bit distressing to wake up and find the nature of sunlight to be altered because of the the smoke particles in the air it's the it's same just, in, yeah it's the same in Seattle today oh yeah it's it's kind of freaky to see the only other time i've seen sunlight altered like this is during an eclipse wow that's a lot of smoke. Yeah, it's the the sunlight has a nature of being yellower and less strong. Uh, one day it was actually orange. I took pictures of sunlight hitting the ground and plants and whatnot, and it was just red. Very strange. <laughs> Remember wow. during one of the eruptions, um, one of the I'm trying to remember where where the volcano was. One of the eruptions that actually uh, west coast of the U.S. the uh, the skyline was completely you know colored from uh, from the the soot from the eruptions and stuff. That was that was trippy enough. But I can only imagine from 
from that scale of wildfire what it's got to be like. Yeah. Uh, so, and that was probably the uh, eruption in southern Wa Washington. So the Seattle folks got that one too. <laughs> How far, how far north is the, like, what's the area covered by the smoke? Uh, satellite pretty much shows it trailing all the way out to Colorado. Esky velocity U.S. west. Wow. It's pretty bad. It's really bad. <clears throat> yeah, pretty much the whole of uh, the west coast. We're all going to move to Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> There, there could be upside. Lived so, over there. No, thank you. <laughs> the, uh, Grew up in Michigan. It, in, color, in, in Colorado, I was reading, I, and I was like, this can't be right. They're, they're, they have fire zones and snow zones. Oh, yeah, that, that's actually correct. <laughs> it's going from 95 to like 37 or 35 today. And it's smoke, fire, snow, in ice zones with a few, not so much. Uh, I just don't even. I... I, the problem is I don't see, I don't, I don't think the next year, you know, it's not gonna change. Well, Has eventually, it, maybe all of California will have burned, <laughs> at, burned at least once by the time you know, 10 years is up. Uh, and this is providing for a clean out of California's oldest state park. Uh, essentially, when it was created, all hmm. forest management pretty much stopped except for dangerous trees and whatnot. So there's a lot of fuel and this is allowing them to take out the dug firs, which burn a lot, and bring it back to what it was originally. Uh, they did lose a lot of redwoods. Uh, most of them were second growth redwoods, one or two of the big ones. But uh, by getting this all cleaned out and literally burned the entire park, didn't leave a single corner. Uh, it will be much healthier when it's all over, but they don't know it's closed for the next year because they don't know what the winter rains will do for landslides and stuff like that. So they're not even going to open it or build structures until it's gone through an entire year. So what is, sheesh, um, I'm trying to think what, I'm, I'm reading um, uh, Octavia Butler's The Parable, Harold the Sower and the Parable of the um, Talents books it, and I, I can't imagine a more relevant book for California at the moment um, because literally they're there it's set in the year 2025 to 2030 but it was written in the in 98 and it's it feels very like she had a crystal ball and described things it was it's pretty, pretty if you haven't read it I highly recommend it especially in California so. Put a note up in the chat so I get the title right. If you would, please. Thanks. I'll actually find it in Amazon. And... I'll start you with the first book. Let's see. Here we go. Oh, that's not the right. That's not the right one. Do not. Well, maybe it is. Uh... It's danger of calling something parable of the sower is that it's an actual parable. Uh, this is what I'm looking for. Yep. All right, this is a better link. But definitely. Thanks. You're welcome. Powerful, interesting book right now. I'll, I'll, if, if you, we can do, we can have an informal book club if people want to start reading some of it. Although we, for the, the theme, we should stick more to um, the Gene Kim, Gene Kim books. Did anybody read Gene's, uh, the, the more recent one, the what, Unicorn? Oh, no, it's on my list. I have not, though. 
Unicorn Project, I think. I have it in front of me, but I haven't read it yet. Oh, all right. Like I fiz I bought I have it here, sitting here. There you go, there's a link for that one. I'm excited I'm a, I'm, to read it, but I just haven't done it yet. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the goal and um and I thought he did a good job with the Phoenix project. But um yeah, I haven't done it. I haven't came out right just at the beginning of the pandemic, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Been waiting for it for a while. I don't know why I haven't I haven't bothered yet. Uh, I need to. Honestly, ever since working from home, I haven't had a commute. So I don't actually have time to read books. Uh, I know. That's exactly my thing. <laughs> I, it, my, my reading list is stacking up. Although I did, uh, I did, <laughs> uh, uh, I learned that I can blot out most of the mowing noise when I mow my lawn with, with an audio book. So mm. I'm getting a little bit, but that's a quite not, not quite the same as a, a daily commute, sadly. I'm competing with my kids. So I'm going to drop the video. Yeah, Keith, how how is it if you're if you're reading it? We can. Uh... It's it's um. It's the same storyline. It's just another side. So if you remember, uh, in the Phoenix Project, you kind of see it through the eyes of the operations head, who kind of, in a way, kind of working his way to almost CTO CIO. And so you see the executive, his interaction with the executive team, his interaction with senior executives. Um, this book is the same story, same timeline, but from the people who are in the trenches. So it's from their view. Oh. Um, so he uses it to um, kind of tell the story of how they pushed from the ground up the concept of uh, DevOps teams and, 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 and working in, 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 um, in uh, not sprints, but eh, sprints, um, okay. um, combine boards and things like that. So it's, it's kind of like they are hearing the rumblings, the announcements are being made, how they're being affected by it, how they're reacting to it, and how they're doing disruption from the ground up how they've in a way they've built this kind of insurgents team that's doing all of the best practices that we read about right in devops and how they, they're doing that trying to go across and then end up building their own little skunk work and so it's kind of an interesting perspective that sounds awesome the uh he's a great storyteller man he really I bet is we can, i bet we can get gene to come to a to a session if we if we commit to reading it um I bet I bet we could do a discussion group, and he and he or one of the co-authors would be willing to jump in. So, are you proposing a DevOps uh, book club? I, I think I am proposing a DevOps book club. I I, I, you know, part of what I want to do is not be dependent only on speakers, but to have some just some regular. You know, y'all are already an amazing discussion group, so I think it'd be fun. I would recommend then an interesting read. If you do Phoenix, accelerate, and this one, the new one, it's an interesting perspective. And, and I take the books and then my own experience. And I think we've had some of these conversations where I've kind of seeded some of them around the whole concept of have we failed? You know, we've invented some of these different processes and are they really making things better? And then I start talking about engineering and the skill sets of engineering. And one of the things you see here in this particular book um, is you, you see the effects of good engineering versus bad engineering um, and how these processes don't eliminate that or help that, right? They just make good engineering better, right? Right. Um, worse engineering, you know, more exposed, but there has to be a focus on good quality engineering, good design techniques, all those kinds of things. And they, and those concepts kind of weave in and out through the book so far. Um, but again, I, I, you know, it would be interesting to get into a debate with him, especially as he's gone through his own transformation from his group being acquired by Google, 
right? Mm. And he's kind of working his way out of that because what does that look like now? Has that diminished the work of their group in their annual survey? What does that mean to the industry? Are we seeing kind of this, I think you mentioned in one talk we had here, where it's been this kind of uh, product-driven change and have, um, yeah. you know, have we as an industry, the, the, the technologists within the industry allowed the product part of that kind of pushes in a direction that takes us away from a holistic um, enterprise view set. It's almost like, I almost feel like it's akin to what it would be like for the defense department prior to the, uh, the defense manufacturing um, ecosystem, the defense manufacturers and their influence on purchasing of systems and what, how that's driven strategy and, and defense strategy and things of that nature right. versus right. how it was before you had this, uh, what is it? The, uh, the, the, the uh, military industrial complex being a, a driver of that, right? So the military drove what they needed and they told the industrial complex with the defense manufacture of defense weapons and systems, what they needed. Now it's almost like reverse where they have gone, the defense industry goes to Congress, Congress and says, defense, you need this. Defense department says, we don't need this weapon. Yeah, you do. Have we now, <laughs> you know, and right? Because it means, it means jobs in their district or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Have we allowed the tools, the products, to drive our solutioning behavior as it relates to DevOps? Um, has the tool chain driven our behavior as opposed to us driving the tools that effectively give us what we need to be better? It's just a question. Oh, I, I, Is that the tools or the marketing? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you just cut right to the bone on that one. Oh, yeah, gosh. that one went right in there. <laughs> better said. Better said. This um, ties right back to the discussion we had with uh, Charity, too. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want to point ahead, out Ryan. one little thing, and that is the whole thing about uh, the processes drive the uh, – the good DevOps to be better, but doesn't do anything for the bad ones. Well, that's an exact description of Agile. Agile was developed by good developers and it works for them. And most of the folks out there have no clue <laughs> and they just go through the motions. It doesn't give them any advantage or anything because they don't know how to actually apply what's good about it to their process but i have my scrum master certificate so that means i can <laughs> in dev better because of that oh my well, rocky God. you know you and i've had this conversation a couple of other sessions where we kind of talk back around this area right and and rob knows i've kind of done this throughout since i've joined these conversations i've kind of seeded these types of topics when we talk about process one of the things that you know I'll be a little controversial here and I'll say this and I said, and I've said this to other folks is that I think the processes in how we deal with technology as a whole from end to end has been driven by the business allowing one side of the house use the lack of transparency on the other side of the house as an excuse for saying, well, we need less documentation, less process, less, you know, whatever in order to so basically do make products better. I'll be more specific. I've, I've grown to think that developers have gotten away with for years complaining that infrastructure moves too slow that infrastructure is not transparent, that they, they, why does it take them so long to give us an instance? And there's, mm -hmm. there's been this push for the last decade or so to make infrastructure move faster, lighter, more flexible, more agile, so to speak. And we have allowed continued bloat, consumption of memory and uh, uh, 
you know, network speed, all those things, there's been this allowed bloat because memory's cheap. You know, uh, bandwidth is cheap. Um, disk space is cheap. And there's not been that same flexibility or agility being applied to developers to be better at what they do, right? I go take a course on uh, Go or uh, Python, and I now have my developer certificate. I'm a developer, but am I an engineer? Do I understand better memory management and what uh, I deliver? Do I understand how to build better software so that I'm being more um, judicious in how I leverage this space in compute power? Ding, 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 ding. Give this man a sucker. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Um, and I'm wondering if this whole remote thing Oops. is going to expose the part of the issue that I saw years and years ago at Cadence Design uh, Systems was that, and they actually did a reasonable job, it's you have senior and Charity talks about this too, you have senior engineers, but how do you transfer that experiential knowledge to the juniors? This whole mentoring thing and demonstrating better use of tools, resources, et cetera, a lot of that has fallen by the way, a lot of that falls by the wayside in a lot of these companies. It's you hire the senior ones, they don't talk to the junior ones. The junior ones make this this mess that the senior ones have to work around, but it all kind of sort of works so they sell the product. And I'm thinking that possibly the remote work uh, concept is going to accentuate this trend even more and people are going to see that there are not and there's not enough collaboration coordination across the different knowledge levels experience levels and it will either cause collapse or cause hopefully cause the business side of the house to realize maybe we should fix something here uh, they might not know what they need to fix but if they can say we need to fix this, that might be enough to get some some of the companies to do something. It, it's funny that you that you mentioned the, the business side because uh, on the previous discussion we were talking about like okay the developers uh, just using memory more memory because it's available using more resources because it's available. Um, I partially understand that yes there there's been more resource consumption nowadays on development project uh, projects. But on the other hand, uh, I also see the developer's perspective on this and that they have, what you said, the business side of, of, the, of the, the company breathing down on them and saying, is this product ready? Is this product ready? Why is this product not ready? So they, they have the choice to either spend a lot of time optimizing their, their code for less infrastructure uh, or they just cut corners. They either risk uh, risk uh, uh, faults because they don't do the testing or they use more resources because it's cheap, it's available, why not use it? Um, I, I also find that many developers are not so well versed in the economies of scaling on, on applications so for them, it works fine on their desktop where they're testing, where they have 32 gigs of RAM and, and, and a Ryzen processor. So like, oh, it's, it's working nice and fast. And then we deploy it in, in the cloud infrastructure and suddenly business comes breathe down on us saying, hey, why is this so expensive? Why are we using these i3 instances instead of like, I don't know, M M3 or whatever? Uh, and it, and we end up having to justify, like, look, we, we need to use these resources because application is developed for these resources. This is this is not a, like a, a mild shift in blame. It's, it's more just like trying to lay out my experience and say, like, okay, 
the, the, the push to get to the market before the, the company's competitors can, can cause a, a, a development cycle to uh, prioritize uh, certain aspects that we wouldn't otherwise if it was up to us. Uh, it is understandable, it, not justifiable, but understandable. Um, and yeah, it's um, it's it's uh, as 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 we also had like in in, in chat with, with charity is like that there is not a lot of pushback from the DevOps community yet uh, when it comes to saying like like this is a bad idea. Uh, in some cases, uh, some some would argue uh, at least on on, on the SRE and security field that it might not be their job to do the pushback or only to say on only to expose the the situation saying okay like if we do it this way it's going to cost it this much if we spend this much more time it's going to cost this much less um but yeah ultimately it's yeah it, it, it there's a whole lot of factors that come into this uh yeah um, part of it, I think, uh, there is just so much, so much hardware resource out there, and it's so easy to get to. Back in the day when we owned our own data centers, and if we needed more, uh, more resource, we actually had to go through a whole purchase cycle and installation of the hardware and whatnot. So, when something fell down because it didn't scale it became more reasonable to go back to the software developer and say fix it than just throw more resources at it because the resources weren't going to be there for a month or two and the time scale has changed because of the whole cloud availability resource availability yeah, yeah, yeah. There's um, may, maybe it's that the this culture of instant grat gratification has uh, uh, infiltrated the DevOps process. Hmm. I just think that you know what it goes back to that conversation we had with Chassis. Is, um, we, I think I said this during that time. Technologists need to be better. Technology leaders need to be better at speaking business tech so that we're able to better explain to business why, you know, we choose to go right, which may take a little bit longer than to go left. Because if we go left, when you come down six months from now and ask for a feature that requires X, Y, and Z, we will have boxed ourselves in versus if we go right because we are leaving ourselves open for future evolution of the product and customer and customer desires. I think if we do a better job of explaining and stop being so um, enamored with our mysterious ways, maybe we'll gain better <laughs> trust. And so the business will then bring us to the table and have more adult conversations. So we can, Rocky, have those conversations about how effective are we using compute power? I've been thinking a lot about how do you better run a technology organization, especially when you're leveraging R&D and innovation as a continuous part of what you do. How do you stay a, a, ahead of the evolutionary curve and effectively inspire your team to take those leaps without bringing back some of those old behaviors where people would de develop code for development sake? You know, when you used to have the Easter eggs because someone thought it was a good idea, right? I mean, that's where we got into extreme programming, right? Was the concept was you develop what's needed, not what you think is needed. But we don't want, but I think we've gotten to a point where we've taken away all of that engineering knowledge and power, and we've kind of disciplined them into not even thinking. So I don't know what the balance is, but I'm hoping that the pendulum now will swing back to the middle, and we will let talented engineers and talented executives that have made their way up through engineering be better leaders of how to communicate technology needs and um, experience to executives, but also teach technology to be better stewards of the, um, the gifts they've been given 
um, so that we can be a more mm. a, a better practitioner of technology. I don't know, just a thought. It is definitely a two part problem though, because I've, I mean, I've been at the level of speaking to C level execs who we need them to be worthy of listening. Excuse me, I'm terribly sorry. We need them to be worthy of kind of listening to our advice also when we give it. Because even when we're as blunt, it is at one, at one point I, I had a conversation with a CEO and founder of the company and at a CPU manufacturing company, which shall not be named, that, you know, about heating, cooling, that sort of thing, and pushing the envelope of our, our data center. And the question that returned back is, well, when will it catch fire? We'll put that fire out literally when it's on fire. Not let's plan for it not to be on fire. Let's wait for it to catch on fire and then we'll douse it with water. And that was the mentality. And, you know, from an engineering perspective, we're always kind of looking at things from a, how do we prevent the fire from ever occurring? Whereas I will constantly get pushback of, well, we'll, we'll put that out when it's on fire and not before. We'll worry about that down the road. We'll worry about backups when we have an issue where we need backups. <laughs> you know, we won't validate our backups. We won't, we won't, we won't call the tapes back from, from the silo, uh, offsite silo and test them. But lo and behold, when we have a, a, a critical need, you know, they better work, but well, we aren't going to pay to actually bring those tapes back and test them because that's man hour and time and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's just, yes. we, we need the sea levels to listen when we do speak and trust us that this or, will cost or, your business or to ask, you know, you know, it's not as the feature done, but you know, what's, what's the, the broader perspective on it. Mm. It's right. The, I mean, these are, these are really hard problems. Um, I, and I actually, I want to take what you're saying, but I want to go back to Keith because you, you would define And when we were talking about the unicorn project, you know, good engineer. And I was, I was interested in, you know, coming back to what you were saying about what is a good engineer, because I'm, I, you know, Patrick, what you're saying on one side is like, you know, it's this balance, right? An engine, a good engineer is going to say, I finished it, but here's the risks or here's problems. I think sometimes the CEOs are like, ship it, you know, so look good on your tail, go. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this as much as anybody else. It's like, all right, I, we're done, we're done enough, go. Um, I don't know. Keep you know, us. it's interesting when, 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 when Patrick was saying that, I, I was remembering, you know, one of the best things that happened to information security was a CEO getting fired mm. because of a breach, right? Target CEO was beloved by, the, by Wall Street, by the, the company itself in the industry, and he was fired because of, of that breach, right? Mm. And Target does some good things, right? You know, we've seen some of the, you know, um, to some of their initiatives in that space. Um, you know, I, I go back in the days when I worked for a financial company in San Diego and I, I think I'm old enough now where I've come to the conclusion is that it's almost, I feel almost like, just like we allowed the quarterly earnings report to drive the way we do business. In other words, unlike Europe, the U.S. singularity in, in, a singular, in a singular focus, the U.S. says, well, am I up for the quarter or down for the quarter? That's all that matters. You know, even the way we deal with how we report our financials, right? They deal with returns. They call it differently, right? The, the way they don't rely on a superstar executive, they rely on consistent performance, we rely on the, you know, the, 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 fla the, the flashy CEO, the one that's, you know, everyone loves because he's so, you know, he or she is, you know, commanding of the quarterly report. I think it is, as Patrick said, a two-part problem. I almost feel like it's a three-part problem. I think we have 
allowed in business as we've allowed in education. I mean, I don't want to get on my soapbox because I have a big one on this one. <laughs> we've allowed the immediacy, the need of the immediate to drive our behavior. And we have, have gotten rid of the adults in the room that says, remember when someone brought down the system because they did an illegal command. Remember what that, and then translate the cost of that to actual dollars. So I, I go back and I think you talk about, you asked a question about good engineering. Good engineering learns from its experience and its mistakes to perform, to, to be better at delivering. I, I remember when I used to hire developers, I used to, back in the day when I did, I hired C++ developers. And someone would say, well, why do you want C++ trained developers? I said, because you know what? Their code has great structure. They think through the, so, the problem. There is, a, there is at least a formation of some kind of consistency that I can bring someone in off the street that has that same skill set, and they'll be able to know where you're going and what you've done. And they'll be able to read and understand it. We've thrown away documentation. Documentation became a bad word. I think Rocky talks about this all the time about, you know, where QA is shift left and that means our QA needs to move faster. And it's, and, you know, and it's, this is battle between QA. Are they a part of the process or are they a protector of the process? And where should they be in that mix? I think we've, we've allowed these silos to become competitive forces to say, I'm, I'm doing my job. I'm good boss. And, and it's them, it's them, it's them. It's not us. Yeah. It's not all of us. And DevOps was supposed to give us that, that we're all part of one team. We have a, 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 a similar focus in delivery. And that's what I mean by good engineering. Good engineering means you solve the problem by thinking of the immediate, but also the future. And you do not limit the solution based on your inability to see the entire force. Does that make sense? It makes a ton of sense to me. Um, I, I have a background in industrial engineering, so I, you're, you're speaking my language. But this is, to me, one of the things that, that is, I've learned to pick up as a trigger word from that perspective is when people get obsessed with efficiency on things, I, I'm, I've learned to translate that word into fragile. <laughs> um, and so like, but some of, so like, like the way I end up coping with this is it's sort of like, all right, if you're, when you're looking for good engineering, we, we have, I, I, what you're saying resonates, right? It's like, all right, I just want to move really quick. I need to build this, get a prototype out and go. Um, you know, I'm not so worried about the long-term sustainability, you know, and, and we've taken the responsibility from the engineering team, from delivering it, or the development team, from delivering into you know, they, they just deliver it. They don't, you know, we compartmentalize these things. It's funny, at the same time, I'm thinking full stack engineering, which I don't believe in full stack engineers either. Um, actually, because full stack engineers highlight this, make this problem even easier to get into. A full stack engineer is more likely to get all their, their whole stack beautiful and not, they don't have the diversity of thought to think through all the problems and documentation to Rocky's point. And, the other other pieces I'm, I, I feel like I'm losing my thread at the end of the day right if you if you focus on just improving your function you're not building stuff that's sustainable for for the broader broader group systems engineering I think mm. maybe systems. what we need in our education even for software just software developers who, who aren't even engineers but just everybody some sort of course that effectively communicates how systems thinking improves everything you do hmm. we're, we're so rocky full circle full circle back to gold rat in my opinion <laughs> on that right yeah so, so rocky would you say what's better a person from a technology institution or a liberal arts degree person? That's an excellent question because in QA, 
one of the things that turned out to be extremely useful, and this is where I talk about diversity and inclusivity, is that the perspective and mind thought and the thought processes of liberal arts folks in QA help to actually find edges and corners that your average user was more likely to hit upon than your technical user. Mm -hmm. And so the best QA teams, even if it was a black box, if you want to call it a black box tester, having people from different disciplines uh, physics or chemistry were, were great because they had this perspective of software should, everything I'm working on should just be tools that should just work. So, you know, where, where does it not work? But with the uh, liberal arts folks, a lot of times it becomes more, well, I'm looking at this as something creative. I'm using it to create things or to do other things that are creative. And so it needs to be flexible enough to be creative also. So having a full range of perspective really helps in making the, whatever you're working, you're developing more broadly useful. Would, would you say that the difference there then is, or 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 the the addition of say the the little arts uh, QA person is that it takes the review of the the product as uh, does this do what it's designed to do versus can this do what I want to do with it? I think that's a good good chunk of it. Yes, and. How does it do it? Can I make sense of how it does it? Or if I do something that doesn't make sense to a technical person, does it still do something useful? <laughs> yeah, I mean, different perspectives often expose those edges as you're talking about. Um, and I found that, you know, that's some of the most, excuse me, some of the most difficult problems that I've, I've kind of faced in, in software challenges were found by people who just approach the product from a vastly different perspective than um, was even intended. And consider the fact that we technical folks, especially we engineers, are in a pretty small minority of the world. So if we want this to be useful to the world, we better get the perspective of the world as opposed to just our little silo of folks. Definitely. I mean, siloing is kind of also kind of circling back to what we were talking about quite a while ago. That siloing concept was, was absolutely kind of uh, paramount to this whole you know, we, we, we don't bring in the juniors and kind of mentor them anymore. We're so used to the, you know, the, our silos of, you know, th throw in, throw in food and bandwidth and, and a product comes out, you know, kind of thing rather than add more people and kind of teach them and bring them up. Because I mean, at least in my experience, many technical organizations view their people as cops that are easily replaceable and rather than let's bring them up and you know you have you have really expensive cogs that yeah it'll cost you a lot of money to replace and you've got really cheap cogs and you know from a I hate to, to I hate to use this terminology because it kind of puts people you know in the, the this the these boxes but it's like I've seen that organizations view engineers this way and rather than saying okay we'll bring in juniors and have them brought up to learn from the seniors have the seniors have this really nice big paycheck and keep things running and give all the grunt work to these kids who are easily replaced 
And mm -hmm. that works well enough because there's enough people willing to do it. But so gotta, it bites companies in the long run. And it's not a good sustainable business practice in my opinion, but. I, yeah. I agree with you. I, there's an interesting, Klaus, that's you. Go ahead if you want to talk. Uh, I, I was just going to comment that, uh, yeah, I, I can I can echo Patrick's uh, thoughts on this. And uh, that particularly like the, the, the coming and bite you later on, uh, because what, when you when you depend on, on on the seniors to do the um, the core work and, and, and even the grunt work to to the juniors, when you lose a senior, it then becomes so much harder to replace. And this is particularly evident in the in the security field, uh, where uh, I forgot where where I saw the article recently, but basically replacing a security engineer takes upwards of eight months mm -hmm. so you're if you lose one of them you're sol and what any that's not even taking probably into consideration the amount of risk exposure that happens during that transitional period because yep. you're talking about potentially you know just amazing amounts of security expo risk exposure. What, how, what, what, what isn't being watched during that time period? What alarms aren't being caught? What, what doors were left open when that person exited? What patches were they waiting to put into place before they, before they walked out the door? Uh, you know, all, all of these. Yeah, all that travel, all that travel knowledge. It's, it's interesting because I was going to run to a different point, the op, the, maybe the opposite point from this. Mm -hmm. Um, which is my experience in, in a lot of cases that people don't give themselves the time to, to learn things and do things right. Um, and, and we're not, we don't send clear signals on that. So like I've watched people like be like, well, I don't have time to learn how to do this right. I'm just going to bang it together and grind it because I'm not <clears throat> either. They're not given the, it's, it's actually funny. I think they're given the time to do it correctly. I think they, don't give them, they don't give themselves the time to do it correctly. So like if a junior person comes up and says, you know, I want to take a week so that I understand this and really understand how to do it right, build the skill set. And it, it, it's important if they, they start with the, I want to take X amount of time, right? If they just say, I'm going to go learn it, it's very unbounded and they can be told no, or it can just become a do it on your own time type of thing. But if, most organizations want their junior people to invest in improving what they're, what they're doing, I, I believe. But I think most junior people, and even senior people, are afraid to ask for the time to improve, you know, document, make things. Right? It's, it's really hard leadership to create space for people to do, be good engineers. I'd like to know where you're working at because that sounds like a great place. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, the reason I say that is just because in, in my experience, it's actually the opposite. Even, uh -huh. even in organizations where the culture of the corporation, as they like to say, is, you know, people first and it's very people oriented and where we want to give people the opportunity to learn, we'll even give you an educational budget when it actually comes time to requesting time or budget to actually expand one's knowledge or expand one's learning. Um, it's often, well, not at this time. Our, 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 our list of to-dos is too great. Our um, quarterly objectives aren't met because it doesn't, you know, that, that learning experience doesn't, uh, you know, your learning experience doesn't enhance the company's bottom line at this time. You know, so even though they have a talking point of saying, we, we, we're people first, we'll educate, you know, our juniors and bring them up. Often when it's actually true, when juniors try to put that into action, they're often met with resi you know, resistance to, to that, so at I least have, in my experience. I have no, a question I've for Patrick too. on this. Patrick, you have your Scrum Master certificate. Is, is there anything in I your don't. Scrum Master's class that uh, tells you how to incorporate learning into a sprint? I actually, but by the way, that, that was actually a joke earlier. I don't know I have it. Um, and I actually don't believe there, I don't believe there is actually, is there? 
Exactly. There is, yeah. yeah, there isn't and, anything in the process uh, there that says it, exactly. We, and we, that's part we of have, the problem. I, I have done it in the past, but it can cause weird results. And actually, can, the, one of the things I don't like about Agile is while it's okay in a, in, to me in a scrum plan to say, hey, I need to learn how to do this. I'm going to budget time to learn. And my delivery for the sprint is that I learn how to do this or I prototype it so I can see if it's a good idea. And, and, and Agile has great language to say, let's spend this sprint building a prototype or learning if this is a good, you know, or doing research. And that becomes a delivery for the sprint um, with very concrete. Um, what the thing I've found is that the way I've seen sprints turn into the busy person gets all the work, they get loaded up first. And then the other people in the group are given jobs that also have to get done but they're not the right people for. And I've seen sprints where basically, you know, junior people or the wrong person spins their wheels for two or three sprints until the person who should have got given, been given the work all along um, gets it. Um, which, is, which is a, it's just a purity thing from an agile perspective. There's agile teams that are like, here's the work queue and you pop off the top because that's the most important and it's prioritized correctly. So put whoever at it is at it. Um, and I, I gave that up. I don't, I don't, that's not all, not don't all engineers have the same skill sets though. It's like that if you don't, yeah, if you, if you have those who are and and they're not all divided necessarily into individual teams that you can divvy your, your task queues up to. You know, sometimes you, you, you've got a general software pool, you know, and that's what you pull from. So at least, I mean, that's why, in my opinion, Agile tends to fall down a lot. Is just that it, it's not Agile enough. It's not, it can't be, you know, yeah, you can remold it and rework it, but then you, you, you start to use the language of Agile, but not the Agile process. Well, it assumes that developers are relatively interchangeable which and that in my experience, they experience. tend not to be. I mean, and that doesn't mean they're good or bad. It just, there's an interchangeability just, thing. That, yeah, that's yeah. one of the things that, that we see. Um, and we do, we do a degree of rotation that we have different engineers who are good at different things or different focus areas. And so if I want something built a certain way, this engineer is much better at it. If I want it built another way, this engineer is better at it. And then the ideal thing is when they swap, right? One works for a while, and then they swap, and then the other one adds their flavor into that work. Um, I, I, I haven't seen quite the same thing from an ops perspective. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe that. Maybe I do. Where the you know the tools that people use. Like we have one person who like just code it in Python and everything's good, and they're, the next person down the line's like, ah, I really prefer Ansible or Bash, or you know, I don't like either of those. I want to do it in Go. Yeah. Go. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Reuse, reuse and ops is really hard. Well, and then like some, you know, ops is pretty generic. You know, you've got network ops, you've got sec ops, you've got, you know, you have all these different mm. facilities. So you can say, I've got an ops person on it. Well, some of your ops people are more security oriented. Some of them are more network oriented. Some of them are more, you know, uh, bare metal server bring up oriented. Some of them are more, you know, it's just more operating system centric. They have a deeper knowledge of the intricacies of, of kernel debug, et cetera. You know, it, it just, everybody is unique and, and, and has their own skill set, and you can't really treat them as, as interchangeable levels of expertise. Hopefully you cross train your team so that they can support each other. And hopefully you have open communication lines so that, it, if someone runs into a problem, they can easily communicate with the other parts of your team. But reality in the world is that people tend to, to not, they want to focus on their stack of, you know, immeasurable stack of problems that are in front of them. And they don't really have time to be interrupted by all the other people who need their help. Cause then you end up with that same thing where you've got one guy with all of the work or one girl with all of the work and getting that, trying to divvy that out is just so difficult. So what you're saying uh, is that at the organizational level and the department level, we really need to adopt good management skills like what is your, 
you know, goals, objectives, what are your founding or operational principles? What are your, what's your mission statement? What are the things that guiding, right? So for instance, we talk about cross training. We talk about making sure in this conversation, we talked about letting you, you know, how do you train your junior so that they're more efficient, they can grow. How do you enforce um, knowledge share? How do you uh, budget for time for training as well as getting work done? All of that sounds like guiding principles. It sounds like that you have to have an organization that at your core, at your fundamental uh, principles have to be, hey, we will do these things. These behaviors get rewarded. These other behaviors do not. And they need to be specifically declared. I think about a story that Jack Welch told back in the day. And um, uh, he was on some, I think it was a CNBC or something like that. And he was talking about, um, he had gotten a call from, one of his on-air talents and he was talking about hey how's it doing he was checking in and he said um you know i i, I heard today that you won't be on the air tomorrow and he goes well why, why are you not on the air and he goes well i got to go to this you know ge mandated training that i have to go through and blah 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 and he goes really and he goes so he calls hr and hr person handles this very depthly he goes the, the, the woman in terms of HR, I think it was at the time, said, that the, uh, this is that training that we've mandated for blah, 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 blah. And Jack Welsh had to apologize to the HR person because he was he was doing exactly which a guiding principle at GE at the time was, if it's organizational training, everyone must go, regardless of where they fit in the organization. This is mandated. This is a must, right? And you don't get special privileges because you have the highest ratings or you are the, you make the more money the best money. Somewhere along the line, we've lost our way in organizational design and principles, and we've stopped doing things that are part of our guiding principles. And those things should override our knee jerk reaction to the situation at hand. I know that sounds philosophical, but I think no, I, I love what you're saying. Actually, what, so one of the things that I had on my list to do. So um, we've been working on principles that guide what we do, design principles along those lines. And it's for the same reason. It's like whenever you're confronted with a dilemma, you want to be able to go and quickly say, is this line up with our principles, yes or no? And if it, that's your test, right? You're, you, you, you fall back to it so that you have you know, some, some foundation, um, which your story illustrates. I was, if, if people are interested, I, would, I need to find a time and the schedule for it, but I would bring this, the six we've got, and I would love to get the group's feedback on it. And you can discuss if it makes sense or not. Um, they're, they're not organ they're organizational, but they're really architectural from that perspective. So if people are interested, I'll put that on the calendar. I'd love to get, uh, this, this group has great insights, so I'd love to see y'all tear them so apart and tell us what they're on. That okay. sounds interesting. It also sounds like we might want to look at, I believe Jack Welch also has a book on management that we might want to consider putting on a list of the book club uh, reading the list. Book club list. <laughs> add, it, add it to the, throw it, throw these, this, I'm, I'll throw um, the, the unicorn project into the, into the channel and we'll start doing that and then we'll, we'll pick up the Jack Walsh one. I actually think it'd be fun to read a book a quarter and throw a meeting about it and then let people join in. And it'd be kind of neat. Yeah, if you, I mean, even if you don't read the book and come, the discussion will be interesting. <laughs> from that perspective. Yeah, as you'll find it interesting, Jack tells the story of how he blew up his first plant and what happened. Ooh, I do want to hear that. All right, so we're, <laughs> we're, we're, starting, we're starting something new, and with that, we are just about out of time. Just quickly, next week, we're going to do the uh, bring popcorn, and we're going to live, live chat um, a, a, present, a, a webinar to see how that works. And then, Greg, we're going to try and get Greg back for the week after that. See, I'm looking at Patrick, see if we can do it. Um, and then I will slot in my schedule. And then we still have the engineer from RackN who is gonna talk about how we're um, turning on S3 buckets dynamically with tokens. Hmm. Cool. So that, that's sort of the Chris Love anti, you know, fix the, fix the problem, problem thing. And then bring more, whatever, whatever you think. Did, um, uh, is Cricket scheduled by any chance? Do you know if Cricket Lou got scheduled by? Oh, I haven't seen it. For DNS? Um, I have not seen him get scheduled, so no. Um, I need to encourage people to just 
basically put it in the events list. So the way yeah, I was going to say, is there a better way to kind of manage the 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 kind of getting a speaker kind of signed up and and conf confirmed and on the on the invite for the list and so it gets on uh, their calendar. Yeah, I mean, the thing to do is to ping me with an email address to do it, but I think that the, the smartest thing to do is for us to just say, if you have an event and, you know, go into the, everybody should have the rights to do it. Um, add an event into the events list mm. in uh, Cloud 2030. And then that will basically, you, you know, if we end up with a conflict, then we'll see it because it'll be pretty obvious. And, and then we're not using a count, you know, that, that solves the calendar. We know when the meetings are, pick, pick the date, and then we'll, we'll run from there. I'm, oh. I'm trying to delegate a little bit on the organizational stuff. So I want to empower people who are like, I want to present on this, on this session. You can block that out. I don't, I don't have a- You, you know, don't have unlimited time? I don't have unlimited time and I don't have an ego on being the person to do all the scheduling. I just, that's a good thing. Yeah. God. I'm very Cheers all. Have, this be. have a good weekend. It's fun. Maybe I'll see some of you uh, Thursday. Have a good disaster <laughs> planning conversation. Too early. Oh yeah. It's a little early. Too early. <laughs> all right. Sorry y'all. Bye guys. Bye. -bye. Bye.